All right, everybody. We good? Yeah? yeah. All right. Happy Wednesday of DrupalCon. Uh, thank you all for joining us um, so bright and early. I'm going to get uh, full screen mode here uh, going. So this is um, some slides that we have with some stats and some facts. Um, it is not going to match our talk track, which is a panel discussion today. Um, we just wanted you all to have something to um, be able to visualize, take pictures of, and if you have any questions, we will be saving plenty of time at the end uh, for q and I am Stacy Fabrera, your panel moderator today. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? All right. Um, I am from phase two. I am the managing director of the health and wellness uh, client services group. And we work with the nation's leading health systems to help them really reimagine what their digital experience should be through the digital products that we create. Um, and for me, what that means is being able to provide patients with greater access than, than ever before to be able to promote their health and well-being. I have two of those incredible clients here with me today. I have Carolina Anthony, the Executive Director of Brand and Content Strategy, joining us from Advent Health today. Advent Health is one of the nation's largest health systems that's uh, single branded and uh, on a uh, very large uh, digital platform. So welcome, Carolina. Woohoo! And I have Daphne Tam joining us from Southwestern Health Resources as the uh, digital lead for marketing and operations. And Southwestern Health Resources is a really unique uh, organization um, in that they are very focused on value-based care. And that perspective that she's going to be representing here today is, is really interesting and unique in that she has the provider lens uh, through which all of this will be um, looked at and, and talked about. Um, so first, I want to just ask folks here in the room, who works for a healthcare organization or within the healthcare industry? Hands up. All right. Who here cares about their health, well-being, or has ever navigated a physician or a health system? All of us, right? <laughs> So we hope that this content is very informative because we all work and uh, manage our care for ourselves, for our loved ones. Um, and so we want to make sure that this is relevant for everyone um, and uh, welcome questions at the end. But for now, I'm going to turn the floor over to Carolina and Daphne to do introductions of their organizations and to talk a little bit about that unique perspective that they're going to be bringing here today. With that, I'll start with Carolina. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Can everybody hear me? Can you, yeah? Closer? Yeah. Closer. How about now? Can you hear me? Great. Uh, I'm so happy to be here with y'all. I'm coming to you from Orlando, Florida, where Advent Health is headquartered. Uh, weather here is amazing. I'm loving it. I'm having the best time of my life. I can't. The humidity index is like zero, and I'm super, super happy. Uh, but I am the executive uh, director of digital brand and content strategy. And what that means at Admin Health is that I oversee the content marketing team, social media team, reputation management, and web marketing, which is how um, I work. I'm privileged to work with our, face, uh, our friends at Phase 2. Um, I'm coming to you, or the perspective that I'm going to be sharing with you today is an in-house agency model. So that's how we're structured. So we're a corporate serv services department that is headquartered in Orlando, but is servicing our entire uh, system across the nation. We're in nine states. We have about 1,200 uh, different locations, about 60 uh, hospitals, and about 8,000 providers across our system. So hi, my name is Daphne Tam, and I am the lead, as um, Stacy shared, for marketing operations and also digital marketing at Southwestern Health Resources. And my team's responsible for content strategy, for, I would say, for all of our digital marketing, but also making sure that we are road mapping uh, with our IT department and with the rest of the organization where we need to go from a healthcare perspective. Uh, for our organization, as Stacy was saying, we are 
really focus on what's called value-based care and population health. And what that means is that instead of going to the hospital multiple times and providers being paid for that, what we're looking at is trying to help the overall uh, healthcare system where it's more about the quality versus the quantity. And so um, at least uh, for those who don't really know what uh, clinically integrated network is, which is where I work, it is basically a network of healthcare providers, and we are the child organization of Texas Health Resources and Southwestern, uh, UT Southwestern. So we have the academic and we have the faith-based organization together, but we connect our providers and our health systems with other access of care, including skilled nursing facilities to home health. And so that is the gist of what we do. Incredible, thank you. So before we dive into self-service, which is where we're gonna spend um, a decent amount of our time uh, sort of focusing on today, I wanna to talk about the digital front door. How many of y'all are familiar with the concept of the digital front door? In healthcare, it's a term that's widely used, but I know it's not all that widely used outside of the industry. So show of hands, digital front door. All right, a few of us here, okay. So let me explain how I think about a digital front door, I think about it as a gateway, right? Um, in a composable architecture, which you've probably heard a lot about uh, the past few days here at DrupalCon, um, this is a way to bring all of the disparate tools and products that run and operate your organization together with more of a, a user experience lens and brand and marketing focus. So it is the way in, through, and to, at the right moment of your journey, um, things like uh, the EHR. Um, you know, we're not going to replicate or deeply integrate ever with Epic and MyChart once you get to the point where you're communicating with your physicians or providers. Um, there's gonna be handshakes and handoff moments. And, that's what the digital front door does. It brings it all together and it stitches uh, together the experience for your patients, for your providers, so that they can easily and seamlessly find what it is that they need. Um, so with that said, I want to ask both Carolina and Daphne, what are you all doing from a digital front door perspective? Um, what does that look like within your organizations today? Yeah. Um, at Avon Health, we think of the digital front door, not just, not only our website, but all of our omni-channel touch points with the consumer. In other words, all of the digital places we're interacting with them outside of the patient care scenario. You know, outside of you coming to the hospital or going to see your provider. So that means that we are um, really streamlining our approach across all of our digital interfaces, web, social, reputation management, content, email marketing, search, uh, our paid campaigns and efforts. And we're garnering all of those insights to really put forth uh, our best impression when you interact with our brand. So one of the, I think, most interesting things about Avent Hill structure is in the past leading other web teams. I'm sure many of you guys are, are part of the web team or interact with the web, web team in your organization was um, full of rich insights, right? Because people are coming to our websites and we're seeing their behavior, their consumption, their conversions, what they're interacting with. But uh, think about how much richer your digital front door is when you're able to connect what's happening on the website with what's happening across the digital ecosystem. Because we're not uh, one dimensional individuals, right? We're waking up, we're checking our email, we're going on Google, we're perhaps depending on your generation, going on Facebook or on TikTok, you know, then um, you're going on a website. So all of these things are extremely important to connect. And that's the way that we um, think about the digital front door at Avid Health, ultimately making it as easy as possible for you to interact with us as you choose to, right? Over the next five, the last five years at Avid Health, we completely restructured our digital marketing discipline to support this concept of a connected, holistic, digital front door experience. Uh, we've also spent a significant amount of time, I sit in digital marketing, obviously, but we are uh, have dependencies on our friends at IT, which many of you are probably a part of. So fortifying those relationships and uh, unifying our roadmaps and initiatives 
to ensure that we're uh, having the same priorities because oftentimes uh, you don't, right, as a marketer and as an IT professional. And of course, aligning with the right uh, partner agency or agencies to help you be flexible, be nimble, um, really maximize your resources so that we can be on the right platform with the right message at the right time, all the while staying on top of trends and vision casting as our digital landscape changes every single day right, to ensure that our digital front door is relevant and contextual to you. That sounds great. Um, very similar to what Carolina was saying is that uh, at Southwestern Health Resources, we also take that omni-channel approach. Um, what we do, I, as I shared earlier, is really help support providers to take care of their patients better. And there are a varying degree of different physicians we work with from different health systems, to a lot of independent community physicians in North Texas. So a lot of their front door is going to be different. How they interact with us is different. It may be through their EMRs. It may be through an email that they get from us to inform them of a new contract negotiation. So there are many different channels that they come in. And so it was really important for us as we wanted to create a better experience for them to really map out what their days look like. And that was a complicated uh, a journey mapping that we had to do. It was based on different audiences. But unless you do something like that, unless you really understand your audiences and where they're at and where they're going to be meeting you, you're not going to be able to create that front door experience that is going to lead to a good handshake or experience afterwards. And it had to mirror that. Um, a lot of our healthcare providers are not just at the desk. They're not just in a clinic. A lot of them are, especially with home health and SNFs, they are actually going out there and they are taking care of their patients and using other devices too as well. So it's really important to make sure that you know how people are interacting with your organization. So that's what we had to do. Great. So let's talk for a minute about self-service and the impacts of allowing patients and providers to do a lot of what they need to do for themselves. Um, in healthcare, self-service is an absolute game changer. It's really been used to empower both patients and providers that um, is sort of getting to that, that golden coordinated model of care that we're all um, seeking both in the healthcare space as well as on the patient side. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what self-service looks like today? Um, Daphne, I'm going to start this one off by going to you. Okay. So self-service to me it equates to empowerment. It's empowering for a population health, empowering individuals to take care of their health better. And uh, it also is empowerment of our providers who are providing that care to the particular patient with information that they need. So as far as self-service, what we did, I'm gonna share with, with you guys of our physician portal that we're currently building. It was really important for us to really know the wants and needs of our physician while we were building self-service. And so a lot of them wanted to know, um, how are they doing with taking care of their patients? Do they have the right data? Uh, do they know how they're going to be incentivized or paid for or compensated for, their, for caring for these patients in the right way? So one of the things that we looked at is basically single sign-on, making sure that they were able to get to certain applications that they needed to without having to log in and re-log in again, but also getting information right at their fingertips, and it was like a one-stop shop. So for, for us, empowering, empowering, I would say, our providers, empowering our providers to take care of our, their patients is part and core to self-service. Yeah, I love that word, and Daphne, empowerment, because let's be honest, I think the pandemic gave us a lot of power to take care of ourselves in every shape or form. I don't want to go to the grocery store. I'm going to order groceries and have them delivered. It's like a simple pleasure, but there's a lot of power in making that decision for yourself. And those expectations that we have in day-to-day -day lives, of course, carry through our health, right? Uh, and our healthcare decisions. Um, for many, many years, I think healthcare has been synonymous with paper forms and lack of availability 24-7. And, and we've all experienced that, right? You go to um, a new provider or whatever it is that your um, service you're trying to get, and it's a stack of 20 sheets of paper for you to have uh, an intake. 
And then when you want to get access to your results or a provider or somebody that can help with your health in your moment of need, uh, for many, many years, that wasn't possible, right? Nowadays, though, consumers expect that. Consumers, 73% of consumers expect to manage their care through some sort of patient portal. So some digital form or mechanism that allows you to make healthcare decisions and proactively plan for your care. So where before that was like the cool, shiny thing, now that is the cost of entry to be successful in the healthcare industry and our consumers are holding us to a really high standard as they should. Uh, as the digital landscape continues to evolve. Um, that number, that 73%, obviously was accelerated significantly by the pandemic, but what we've seen is that that continues to rise, even now that we're, I don't know, in this weird sort of, are we in pandemic, are we not, you know, depending on what day um, that you're tracking um, COVID, uh, you'll hear different things. So um, that really brings self-service, right? The, the concept of, of putting that power in your hands front and center. In healthcare, you're seeing that probably in different shapes of form, depending on where you get your care. So for example, you might have a pre-registration before you come to an appointment where you're filling out information about yourself so that when you get to the provider, you're just checking in and waiting to be seen which makes the process so much easier, right? Or perhaps you're scheduling your appointment online or making payments online or accessing your digital health records. Hey, I had a, an, a lab uh, a few months ago. What were, what were the results of that? Or I need to uh, have some blood work done. Let me go ahead and schedule that and see all those results in one holistic place. Um, large health systems are really trying to lean into technology so that we can focus our time when you're with us, our patients are with us, to do what we do best, which is take good care of you and maximize the patient experience and the points of touch there. So at Avon Health, we really keep that in mind. We have a pretty robust um, discipline around all of our consumer tools and their, those intersections. Some of those that we're hyper-focused on is our provider directory, so you can find the, the care you're looking for, our scheduler. We have a chat bot that um, actually integrates with a new service that we have called Care Advocacy. And what that means is we recognize that uh, healthcare can be a little bit intimidating depending on your level of comfort. And sometimes it can be very mysterious, like what happens with my stuff, right? And so we, we put forth what we call care advocates, which are assigned to you, and they're able to, uh, they're personal, real humans that are helping you schedule your appointments, uh, refill your prescriptions, explain to you what a procedure you're getting ready to have is, answering your questions, sort of demystifying healthcare and making really accessible. That's very dependent into our chatbot. That's the first sort of point of entry. And then it kind of goes from there. So there's just one of, one of the many ways that we're trying to make things easier for our consumers in the space of self-service. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the pandemic we all experienced over the past few years, and it changed and rocked every industry, but especially, especially healthcare. Um, I think we all watched uh, healthcare change overnight from what was more or less an in-person and physical experience to a virtual one. Um, and we've been working with healthcare and health systems over the last six years, and that rate of, of change and adoption of new technology um, seems like it, it just changed overnight from an organizational perspective. I would love to hear your point of view um, about how the decision making has changed within your organizations with bringing new technology to bear online um, in, in terms of how much it increased speed to market. Um, I just noticed that was one of the biggest shifts being on the uh, digital agency side to then seeing um, how willing everybody was to try new things. Um, that was one of the more interesting shifts that I think we all uh, took part in over the last few years. So I would be curious to hear, Daphne, I'll start with you. How 
has the, the past few years really changed the decision making and the process within your organization to adopt new technologies? Yeah, that's a really great question because our organization is not that old. We're about two years old as an organization. So when we started as a, a new nonprofit that, that was responsible for population health and we take care of more than 700,000 lives, we saw basically people delaying care during that period of time. They did not, not want to go into the hospital. They did not want to go see their doctors with the fear that they may get COVID. As a result of that, we saw, um, I would say, people arriving dead on arrival, unfortunately, at the hospital because they delayed care for stroke and heart health. So there were a few things that we needed to do really immediately as an organization to take care of the patients. And so one of the things we did um, through our analytics team was really identify 200,000 high-risk patients, be able to contact them electronically to go and encourage them, just provide them edu educational material of what to do during this period of time and not to delay health. As a result of that, we saw an uptick with uh, televisits and phone calls to the doctors. The other thing we had to do too in um, Dallas-Fort Worth, a lot of the independent primary care physicians and specialists did not have telehealth services. So what we had to do within a month was to uh, help more than 400 physicians, our primary care physicians, get up to speed with the technology, provided them the technology, provided them the know-how of how to use that technology and support them in getting their patients online, but also provide them um, some of the information they needed from a health plan payer perspective to be able to get credit for those particular visits because it hit a lot of the primary care physicians hard during that time. Where other physicians outside of our network were closing down, we were able to help them keep their, I would say, virtual doors open. Yeah, you know, um, during the pandemic, pre-pandemic in 2019, beautiful 2019, nice and shiny <laughs> 2019, um, only uh, about 30% of people were booking appointments online for healthcare. That was kind of the norm. Uh, Post-pandemic, that number is about 65% now. So it's doubled in about a little bit over two years. And that number continues to rise. And out of that, telehealth, right, or online visits, seeing your provider through your virtual device of choice has continued to climb. So uh, recently there was a survey done for those that have received uh, telehealth care, right, um, if they are going to stick to it now that the world is quote unquote back to normal, are you going to continue to get virtual care or do you prefer to go um, to see your provider in person? And 43% of those consumers said, no, why would I go back? I'm just going to keep doing telehealth. That's a huge number and completely changing the paradigm of traditional healthcare models and forcing healthcare organizations to be more agile than I think we've ever have been. Um, let's face it, when you think cutting edge and agile, you do not think healthcare, right? Like everybody knows that we're a little, we tend to be a little bit slower to adapt. Um, and so it is extremely important. A lot of healthcare organizations as of late, if they weren't structured this way, have been investing a significant amount of dollars, resources, and structure to support digital in order to be reactionary to the ever-changing landscape that we have constantly, right? So luckily for Advent Health, we had online scheduling stood up, we had telehealth stood up, but we were learning fairly quickly how people were utilizing the tools we had built, uh, what some of the pain points or pinch points were, and we're iterating constantly to ensure we're improving it. So it's not enough that you put out a product out there when the market needs it. They expect it to be better and better based on what they interact with you. So it's important to read the tea leaves, right, and make sure you're connecting the dots. Um, the beauty of working in digital marketing is we don't have to guess if something works because we know, right? But how many of us really make it a prerogative to be become data experts and let that lead the way in our decisions, in our roadmaps, in our prioritization structures? So we've been going through a, a radical 
uh, structure and process alignment to ensure that we are being nimble first and foremost to improve our touch points with our consumers along the way. Thank you both. Um, Carolina, you mentioned your platform. It's been live for four plus years and you're continuing to iterate in an agile manner uh, through looking at data and analytics and understanding um, what users are experiencing. Um, how much have you seen going in the direction of self-service shift your business? And um, you shared some stats, I think it was yesterday, with the Healthcare Summit audience that might be interesting to share here in terms of yeah. uh, the traffic, yes. the performance, yeah. Yeah, so um, we have seen our appointment bookings, online appointment books, bookings are up 37% uh, right now, which is just astronomical growth for healthcare. And our sessions, uh, uniques to our site uh, is up 80% year over year. Um, it is incredible the amount of education that the patient is seeking out as they're trying to navigate this new normal and take care of not just themselves, but their families and their loved ones. So we at Avon Health have been really uh, focused in being as nimble as we can. And um, we've adopted this model that uh, we joke around, we call it get low, it's good enough to move on. So it's like the MVP. So like, let's get low this, let's get something out there and then let's get consumer insights in and then let's let, let our consumers tell us where they want us to pivot or where they want us to go. Um, and that's served us really well because oftentimes what we found is that even though we might create a tool set or, or some new functionality and we anticipate the consumer's uh, interaction with it, oftentimes it's different, right? And that's not a bad thing, right? Like use, use us, come to us, that's what we want you to do. But not, don't be so stuck in your ways that you're not really reacting to your consumer. So uh, a, a good sort of nugget to carry away is like oftentimes we get so lost in perfection uh, and the consumer, I think nowadays, doesn't expect perfection so much as they expect uh, contextual, real-time support. So get mo, get it out there, get some insights, and most importantly, have a structure and a process in place to garner those consumer insights quickly and be able to optimize, pivot, whatever you need to do based on what your consumers are telling you. Get Mo. All right. Um, you also said something at the Health Summit that I, I think would be interesting to, for this group to hear as well. Um, your platform doesn't only support the, the patient experience, it also supports your team and it empowers your team to be able to very quickly and nimbly um, build microsites and landing pages and things that used to take you, uh, I think yesterday you said months. Um, now just takes a few weeks and most of that time is gathering the content, the images, getting the approval, uh, and being able to stand those up uh, on your own without um, having to have dependencies on other teams, other departments. So I'd be curious to hear just a little bit or if you could talk to this audience a little bit about um, how your team has been empowered through the platform uh, as well as your patients. Yeah. So about five years ago or so, we were a decentralized regional system. So we had all these hospitals with their own unique brands across our system. So if you went to get care in Florida, we were known as Florida Hospital. If you were in Kansas City, we were known as Shawnee Mission Regional Hospital, so on and so forth. And so we decided to centralize our brand into Avon Health five years ago. And part of that exercise was taking a very fragmented web landscape of 20 C different CMSs across our nine states and centralizing it into one highly customized Drupal instance. That's uh, how our relationship with Phase 2 started. And so what we've built is a, a flexible infrastructure that allows our decentralized CMS because all of our markets have uh, stakeholders that have logins and can control specific areas of the site that are tied to their local market. 
to be able to uh, create their own landing pages and update their own content and not have to go through the web team to do that, which was how historically it was done before. And it's empowered the web team to uh, create very complex, large websites fairly quickly. So a website that used to take maybe six months to build now can take three to four weeks to build um, with a consistency of consumer tools with consistency in design, uh, brand standards, best practices, schema markups, SEO, you name it, it's there. And that flexibility allows us to be very nimble on the web team front, right? To ensure that we are maximizing the use of our resources. It empowers the local marketplace to uh, feel like they're in control of their own market because there are the market experts, right? I'm not in Chicago. The Chicago team is in Chicago and they understand those consumers better than I will probably ever understand them. So let them build that landing page. And then as a web team, go back and optimize it. If there's ways to optimize it, fix anything that is broken, educate that CMS user and how they can make that better, teach them how to fish, and then it'll propagate from there. So it's been an invaluable framework that obviously couldn't happen with, without Drupal, part of the reason why, why we're here, and couldn't happen without our friends at Phase 2. All right, thank you. Uh, Daphne, I want to um, talk with you a little bit about the three-site digital ecosystem uh, that we're working on together. We just recently launched the Digital Workplace. Um, that's one of the sites on the ecosystem that will also soon house both a provider portal um, as well as a public-facing website. Uh, we're in the midst of, of building that currently. Um, can you walk us through the approach at a high level about the three-site ecosystem that we're putting into place, Daphne? Yeah, so as a new organization, we kind of inherited uh, some websites along the way as we acquired a different organization. So we had a couple of WordPress sites that were being used. One was for uh, our providers. The other one was uh, something that we kind of cobbled together for our, um, our intranet. And we had a public website that was built on Drupal 8. So we were taking a look at what we were doing as an organization. And we're like, this doesn't make sense. I'm having to populate content on three different sites. And of course, when you're a healthcare organization and you have to provide information that's accurate and up to speed, that was not the efficient way of doing it. Also, it wasn't bringing joy to any of our audiences. Our providers were having to log into many different websites and you know it was just a headache for our employees as well so we decided to reboot um, so uh, we engaged with phase two to help us with taking a look how can we make this more holistic how can we make sure that in what we're doing we're being nimble efficient uh, we can get a platform that was good it was powerful it was something that could be flexible and so a structure that could be scalable over time so for us, what we did was we really took a look at what the, the needs are, of course, what are organizational goals overall, what are we trying to do, but then making sure that we understood deeply what our audiences needed. And so we created a digital ecosystem, what we call it ecosystem, where we have the public website, uh, intranet, and also our physician portal all on Drupal 9. Okay, and so depending on what audiences we had to serve up information, we can publish it to those sites. Uh, that those sites would be securely accessible to those various audiences. We provide things like personalization, where uh, different groups could get certain bits of information. Anybody's car? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, so yeah, so people can get information. Our providers could get information if they wanted to. They would get notifications of new uh, bits of information that they needed. And uh, for our employees, um, I don't know if I should just launch into this now, but our employees, for a self-service perspective, found it much easier to be able to not only find uh, information that they needed, which that's what they wanted. They wanted to be able to connect with the organization better. Uh, they wanted to also know each other because as a new organization, mostly existing during pandemic, they really didn't know who worked in what teams, who each other were, 
all they had were basically Zoom calls or Teams calls every day that they would see people, but they had no idea how things were connected. Um, another thing that they wanted at the end of the day, same thing with our providers, is just more time to do meaningful work. And for our employees, that means being part of Southwestern Health Resources to take care of people, but our providers really needed more time to take care of their patients. Um, so anyway, so that's, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, where do you both see um, self-service for patients and providers going in the near and long term? What are some of the trends that you're seeing? You want to go first? Oh, yes. Daphne. Oh, me. Okay. Uh, some of the trends for self-service, people are so accustomed, right, to, hey, retail, the retail experience, like Amazon. I go online, I order something, and I get it within a day or two days or less than 24 hours sometimes. So with self-service, I really believe that that has, that's changing how, how people are also looking and seeking for care as well as we've seen. So um, I, I do believe the quicker, the faster that people could get information, the most accurate uh, is where self-service is going. Great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, the logical answer, I think the answer we all know is it's gonna continue to rise, right? But I think what's important to, to uh, watch there is um, recently Gartner published a, a study that said that 96% of customers who have a high effort service interaction, like they're repeating the same information over and over, or um, they're trans getting transferred from person to person to person, or that touch base feels very genetic, 96% of them are more likely to become disloyal to that brand. That is huge. Because as marketers, you know, I'm focused in getting people into the funnel. Everybody knows that, right? So like, let's get them to our brand. But if they're having touch points with us that feel uh, cold, generic, cookie cutter, they're not gonna come back, right? That's really important. And the flip side of that, if you have a low effort touch point with somebody, they're only 9% likely to become disloyal. So that, that is a significant difference, right? And it gives us an opportunity for us to maximize those, really focus on those interaction points for sales service as it continues to climb. I think it needs to be easier than ever to find care, schedule an appointment, check in. Um, when you go in to see your provider, receive care as easily as possible, making that payment quickly, accessing your records, uh, really easy to navigate all of the communication touch points. And as this happens, as self-service continues to rise, I think education will be just as important uh, because uh, consumers are at uh, different adoption rates, right? We service a really broad population. Uh, some of our uh, patients are very digitally savvy, some are not, right? So how do you bring them along the journey and not forget them along the way? So it's important that we think through that education piece as uh, self-service so becomes more robust. And then lastly, I think longer term, all-in-one solutions that automate all of the processes like check-in and eliminate wait times and the need to fill out forms are going to be essential for not just healthcare, but for other verticals and industries that have those one-to-one -one touch points. So we'll need to integrate all that data, right? Uh, because it's there's robust, robust data in different packets. So we will need to be uh, creating connection points that allow us to follow your journey and your experience along the way in our case through your doctors, hospitals, insurance companies, all that stuff. Thank you. Um, we're at 9.08, and this wraps up at, at 9.20. But I would like for both of you, if you can, to um, maybe give the audience three things that they could uh, take away from our conversation today. And then we'll turn it over to Q&A. All right. I can start. Thank you. Um, so the first one is, um, you know, with more data comes more responsibility. So make sure that you are making connection points and not letting the data sit dormant. We work in digital, that's the beauty of what we do. So become a data expert, lean into it, 
and let that drive the way, be your North Star in your decisions for the consumer journey. Um, I think also um, cybersecurity, <laughs> really, really, really important. Uh, our consumers are being uh, holding us to a high caliber, uh, high, higher caliber than ever, especially with their data and uh, privacy. So ensuring that you have a good infrastructure there, especially if you work in healthcare, you know, that goes hand in hand. But even outside of that, I mean, think about um, how many times your friends' accounts uh, are hacked or, you know, you don't have access to your email anymore and the importance of if you're collecting data from a consumer, giving them peace of mind and retaining their trust so that they come back to you again and again because the moment you lose that trust, all the work that you did up to that point to capture that person is gone. And then uh, lastly, double down on innovation. I think um, you don't only have to follow the trends, but create your own trends. You know, like if it doesn't exist, create it. Um, I think uh, as, as industries become more competitive for healthcare, we have a lot of uh, non-healthcare organizations coming into our space, like the Walmarts of the world, for example, who knew, right? that they're, they were going to be offering um, services to healthcare patients. So it's important to really think about things differently and not just wait for a trend to catch on for you to react, but create net new things and try them. And if you fail, fail quickly, move on to the next thing and iterate. And get Mo. Yeah. Get Mo. I'm, I'm going to be using get Mo <laughs> more often. Uh, I love that term. You should trademark it. <laughs> I just trademarked it. Put a little red on and Daphne, uh, three things. Three things. I would say uh, just make sure that as you, you do your development, just keep your audience um, at the center of it. Uh, know who they are. Also, um, I would say, too, uh, instead of just, uh, you know, this is what, what we try to remember always. It's not like, hey, we launch it, it's one and done, and it's good to go, and that's it, right? It's like, let's take a look at it. What is it working? You know, and let's have those those meetings together. And you know, it do we need to iterate? How do we iterate this, making sure that there is a clear path forward in that? Also, um, the what Carolina was saying so beautifully about we see all these innovative partnerships that are happening in the healthcare space to make uh, that experience better for consumers and everybody else who needs to access healthcare. Uh, a lot of that is trying to reduce the friction of getting care when you need to, and that is so important. For us as a population health organization, it is very difficult to, you could give people all the information that they would need in education about diabetes care to take care of their heart condition, but unless you make it easier for them, they're not going to go out there and get their care. So, you know, how can we innovate how can we work together as a community to make this easier to take care of our, ourselves, our loved ones, and the whole system at large? Thank you. All right, that concludes um, our, our portion of the discussion. We would love to open up for Q&A. Any questions from the audience? And thank you, Daphne and Carolina. Yes. So the question, if I have it correctly, is how do we help the folks that aren't as digitally enabled be able to receive care? Ground zero for no digital. Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, I don't know if either one of you have a perspective yeah. to share on that. Um, for us uh, at Southwestern Health Resources, we have um, populations of individuals who don't have uh, digital access. And so what we do is we, we still depend on snail mail 
phone calls, home visits. So that's how we got through a lot of the pandemic, especially with those who needed care but didn't have access. Uh, we still rely on a lot of mail and yeah, a lot of phone calls. So we look at other means to, to reach out to our patients. And yeah, I, I think it's just important to know your, your audience base. And if you have that insight that your audience is not digitally savvy, you need to have a path to entry for that audience, whatever that path might be. So for example, we have a service, um, we have a partnership with a service called Dispatch Health where mm -hmm. you can make an appointment and they'll come to your house and do screenings or take care of, of you at home. If you wanna come at home, you can schedule online, but there's also a phone number that you can schedule if that's your mechanism. So making sure that you're making a conscious effort not to leave any consumers behind as the digital evolution happens. But in order to make those decisions and prioritize how much time and resources you spend to communicating to the audience, you need to understand what that makeup is in your for your particular organization or brand and then prioritize accordingly. But ensure that as you're iterating and, and moving forward that you don't leave them behind and offer them a mechanism to interact with your brand. And I think there's another interesting element from a population health angle here too, where you all are using data and insights collectively gained um, from payers and insurers to then figure out what populations are at, gr at a greater risk and being able to um, have touch points with them, whether that be digital or not. And so I think that's a really um, proactive approach that you all are taking as well. Um, and where able, um, you know, you, you opened with that story, Daphne, about um, going to the patient population that's more at risk uh, for stroke and being able to reach out to them and say, hey, it's still okay to come in, it's time, um, we would like to see you now. Great question, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. So many. We work yeah, in healthcare. <laughs> yeah, so um, if you're not BFFs with your legal risk and compliance department and your Department of Security office, office you should be BFFs with them. Um, uh, that's something that I was very intentional on, uh, building strong relationships and building my relationship capital. So when I had to withdraw some things to have hard conversations, I was still in the, in the positive, in the black. Um, so what, what we did from an organizational structure was take a look at not just where our organization was, but where our organization is trying to go. So planning for the future versus solving for the problems of today, because we knew that if we restructured for today, two years from now, we would be restructuring again right, because it's, it's evolving so quickly. So um, we had a series of design thinking sessions. We have a design center at Avid Health that uh, really helps you think outside of the box and think beyond yourself. Oftentimes we're very um, focused on protecting our own headcount or uh, protecting our own sort of areas of purview, but at the end of the day, that may not be what serves the consumer best right? So getting the right stakeholders in the room to think together without siloed lines and kind of separations is the first place. Getting alignment on this is what's best for the consumer, first and foremost, and therefore what's best for our organization, because if we have more consumers, we will grow. Um, and then structuring from there, but it's important that you have the people in the room from all of these different groups to create consensus around what is the right thing to do. Because oftentimes where that fails is marketing's got this idea, so they, they want to structure things one way. And then IT's meeting, and they're having their own thing. And then legal things, this should be the way. And everybody's kind of having these siloed conversations. They're great conversations, very well-intentioned, but not uh, there's no synergy there, and there's no alignment there. So that's the biggest piece of advice I would give you is get them all in a room 
um, ha think about things with being consumer centric, being relentless about serving your consumer well, and then build your structure from there. Build a structure, not for today, but where you're trying to go, even if that's small, you know, but if you have the right structure, then, you know, as you grow, you can add two or three or four people into the fold and you have the right structure versus solving for today and then having to readdress every two to three years because that's exhausting. Nobody wants to completely flip their, their business model every, every two to three years. Is that helpful? Right. Any other questions? We have about a minute left. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, we're here if you have any questions for us at the end. Thank you.